hello and welcome to part two of Chiefs of Staff of the Axis Navy's comment response. And we're starting off with the first Italian of the series, Domenico Cavanari. Okay. I'm going to leave it now as saying that he is not my favorite. Mick Vaughan, thanks for the great video series. Uh, Dr. Clark, looking forward to read your book. That hopefully is out in January on Tribal's Battles and Daring Glass Destroyers. Steam Cross, great vid. I thought one of the main issues between the Rage of Marina and Rage of Aeronautica was their relationship being basically A. Sir, the Air Force are on the phone. Admiral, tell him to go kill himself, and I hope his mother gets something by a goat. It gets worse. Aid. Unfortunately, the Admiral isn't around now. Basically not quite as bad as the IG and IGA, but not much better either. Just less murdery, with the Rager Aeronautica saying flying stuff was theirs and theirs only. It took the realities of war to force them to work, uh, uh, force them out of it, but even then, cooperation between the two was a best limited, and their relationship never was uh, went above coldly cordial. That kind of working relationship, such as it would put uh, a huge crump in any carrier plans. To an extent... Dent, but as I said, at several points, the um, Kaminari's successor was actually in charge of both services to an extent. So, um, yeah. Andrew Cox, the best relationship between the Navy and Army and Air Force seems to have been a long-standing feature of pretty much every major power in the 1920s and 30s. Look at the UK until the RN got the fleet air arm. To an extent, yes. Uh, the point Dr. Clark is making is that Regimina was uniquely positioned to solve this, as Il Duce was the na naval minister. Il Duce, the Rage Aeronautica won't give us pla uh, pla planes for our new carriers. Would you rule out which you launched last month? So which generals do I need to fight? Pretty much. He has the dictator as his literal minister of the navy. Use it. I'm not saying. I... I agree with the Il Duce. In fact, frankly, I think he deserves more the title Fat Boy Fun Boy than, uh, than Henry VIII does. But Henry VIII got given that title by Professor Glenn Richardson. And I have used it ever since. And Il Duce is definitely no Henry VIII. Henry VIII would have had a carrier, mainly because he just would have liked one. Um. They're just, they're just, they're just, there's just no way to describe how poor this gentleman is, really, as a naval officer. Andrew Cox. You know, I get the impression you aren't very impressed with him. No, I'm really not. Cavanari, no. Let me see. What is your most favorite indecisive battle? Um, It's probably Cert in World War II. Uh, Monitor versus Virginia for the U.S. Civil War. And there are a couple in the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, the reason I'm keeping quiet on some of them is because we're going to be going through on some points. I want to do, but I'm going to do more videos about battles. I love doing videos about battles, especially ones which aren't the famous ones. I'm probably going to do something about the Battle of Trafalgar because if anyone's um, noticed something, <clears throat> the 21st of October happens to be a Thursday. <laughs> Unusual day for a live, so I'm fairly sure there's going to be a live on the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, unless someone invites me to a Trafalgar dinner, in which case, yum. And the live will be on the Friday. Legret, uh, before you read too much into how long it took him to make the Tenkaman of promotions during the interwar period are glacial in a lot of countries. The US Army being a particularly notorious case. Agreed, but I, no, he's just, no, look, he, he, the, the description of him, no. Uh, Deep 25, I can understand not being sold on the idea of a carrier. The Italian logic of their theatre for operations will always be in range of land-based air power, mirrors the RN thinking behind the armoured carrier. But to not push for an Italian fleet air arm to, lever the, lever, to leverage that advantage and stall out the cruiser program are very serious missteps, especially when we look historically at how influential cruisers were. They were often the actual big bad ships, and navies had lots of cruisers tended to generally do quite well. Who would think it? The class of ship that can do a little bit of everything and can be used in most types of engagement was quite important. True. Then Deeks25 did some more questions, and I'm glad to say there aren't many more on Cavanari. It's literally all Deeks25 questions. Thank you. Um, I'm curious if Cavanari knew anything about the deficiencies of the shell manufacturing, or was the Italian Navy completely in dark on us, or was it simply there was nothing Cavanari could do about the issue? 
Now, my answer to this is interesting. The answer is he should have done, but doesn't seem to have, or rather, if he did know, he certainly didn't throw the full power of his office in person into the issue. Again, his Minister of the Navy is Il Duce. Go to Il Duce. Say, Sir, I have some terrible news. Our Navy are being supplied with substandard shells. Those brave men who are going out to fight for you, fight for our country, are being stabbed in the back by evil, evil, cowardly communists in the munitions factories. Now, the reason you say that not the capitalist owners of the munition factories is because most of them back up Mussolini. But they also liked Mussolini for getting rid of the union movements and dealing with those issues. So, suddenly putting the idea of communists in munition factories doing bad work would probably have got you inspectors going around the munitions factories anyway. And whilst they're checking for standards, and the blame is not going to go on the plutocrat who's, paying the, who's getting the profits, the plutocrat isn't going to care that possibly his profits, the profits are going down just as long as someone else is getting the blame and he's still getting the money. Dix25. It's an area that always intrigues me. How did these senior personnel not know about the manufacturing problems before Italy entered the war? And then why does it seem so little to nothing is done was done to correct the issue? Even taking into account the problems that come with trying to make infrastructure changes. Let's put it this way. There are some admirals in the Italian Navy who would have done something about it. And there are some who wouldn't. Unfortunately, Cavanari seems to be in the latter club. He really does. He really does. Now, part four. Canaris, the head of the advert. Tobias GR3Y. I can safely say this is now my favorite character of history that everyone knows nothing about. Only one man can go to Spain to negotiate an alliance, but come back with a pension for his wife. What an enigma. True. Juicy decision. Look, there's going to be a war, and I think you should officially stay out. Give a little under the table help, but don't jump in no matter what. I can manage the fallout, don't worry. What do I want to return? How about a nice little villa in Madrid and a small token of gratitude after this war is over? Uh, this is over? I don't know about the latter. As I said, my response is I'm not so sure about the latter. I think he knew that Heydrich and Himmler were after him and that his days were numbered when he went. I really do. He knows he isn't going to survive forever. And whilst realising he supposedly has a relationship with a Polish spy that feeds information straight through to the Allies by whatever he leaks to her, a very useful communications channel, I'll put another way for Canaris, to try and manage the war, I think the legacy of the Pension Act suggests that he was trying to protect his wife no matter what happened to him. And I think that's possibly the reason for his uh, what he says and what, the, uh, what happens, whatever's negotiated there. He's known Franco for several years. He was involved in the Civil War. Uh, he was involved in all sorts of other issues there, even before the Civil War. So he has a long-standing relationship with Spain. And I think maybe either Franco or he, possibly Franco, possibly some other friends, he confided what he thought would happen. And he, they promised, because of whatever he had done for them, that they would look after his wife. Whatever happened, look after his wife. And remember, up until he gets made the Abwehr head, he was expecting to retire. Canaris was expecting to retire to a, a little village on the coast with his wife. That's what he was... He was commanding a base. He didn't expect to get any further than captain. He was a senior captain, but he was not going to get to Admiral. He knew that, and he was okay with that. He realized he he was happy.
as Hashim says, incredibly resourceful and daring too, getting his way back to internment uh, out of internment in Chile and back to Germany via Portugal. Hmm. Yeah. Sometimes, in defense of Chamberlain and his minions, Nazis use a lot of J uh, 52 airliners as bombers in the Spanish Civil War. This is based off the fact Canaris plants of fear in the British press and the British uh, mindset of the Chamberlain, especially, that Germany is going to seize airports in the Netherlands and use them to bomb Britain. However, as Nick Vorden points out, to be fair, the Ju-52 M3 was first used as an auxiliary bomber and then refitted as a transport aircraft. Civilian version was apparently subsidized to be fitted for, uh, subsidized in order to be fitted for, but not with bomber equipment. True. <sighs> Good lord, Pompadour land. I'm going to skip through these slides. I'm sorry. I just don't like. Them. He's an idiot. Go to Canaris, Wilhelm Canaris. Um. But he's uh, but. But saying that the British new air ministry knew the capabilities of those aircraft, British air ministry knew the capabilities, the numbers of these aircraft. They didn't expect them to be involved, and they weren't really involved in any bombing campaign against Britain because even at that point, Britain has some fairly, for their time, decent fighters that would have shredded such bombers. Juicy student. So could we argue Canaris was responsible for the creation of the Spitfire and Hurricane, thereby shooting German efforts in the foot, albeit six years later? Uh, to be fair, they, they've been being developed for a while, and there is a fighter program, but it does suddenly have some interesting work. Uh, but seriously, he seems fascinating. Something, uh, Someone surfing on the way of history and seeing that he's headed for the rocks but couldn't really get out of the way. True. Old Richard is described as Hitler's Lord Veraris, uh, Vasaris, Master of the Whispers, and I would agree with that to an extent, in that Vasaris, uh, Vasaris, Vasaris has always seemed to me as a character. He's aiming for the good of the kingdom. He wants a good ruler. He doesn't care who it is. And that's Canaris, really. He's looking for someone who will restore Germany to its glory, but honourably. Steenwich. His visit to Portsmouth Plymouth in 1915. In those days, German spies were held in the tower and hanged or shot. Bear with me a bit. My grandfather was a Swede and had been in the French Foreign Legion since 1914. When he was 16 years, he, wouldn't, he was wounded two times in the trenches and once in a plane crash. Since he had a 20 centimeter long bayonet wound on his shin, which limited his duty as he was jumping down into a German trench, he was dragged into being an aircraft mechanic. They had to take a ride in every plane they, required, they repaired as insurance that they'd done a proper job, and the plane crashed on landing, but at least the engine had not been a fault. During the wound convalescence, he travelled to England to see a friend in the Swedish embassy there, and was immediately arrested and put in the tower as a German spy. He told me they tried to turn him, but of course there was nothing to turn. Eventually his bona fides from the French and Swedes came through, and he was released after over a month in the tower. By the way, his other trench wound was from a shell fragment that cut into his left eye pupil, and from then on his eye had a little piece cut out of the outside of the blue. The plane crash damaged the ligaments in the same leg that he would scar on, and wrench his back. He had narrowly escaped death in the first gas attacks. They used urine-soaked rags to survive. Your grandfather sounds like he had a frickin' interesting life. Scary, but interesting. Anyway, one wonders if Canaris was picked up and turned then. It would, it would answer a lot. Like, first of all, how security around a major naval base area, a naval base area missed him. He never got off the ship. Uh, then, of course, later with such things as him personally talking Frank, uh, talking Frank out of the full German alliance. Uh, not really sure that's really a major thing. He doesn't think it's that massive. Or missing the obvious signs that the network in the UK had been completely compromised and it's only passing on disinformation, plus the Germans not using proper spycraft appear to check on them. Mm, mainly because they were limited in what spycraft they could do to check on them, but also there's the fact that there was that information service purposes, so does he care? We would never hear that admitted even 200 years later. Because the basic concept of espionage remained the same, and the idea of such a huge coup being impossible should not be put out there, and uh, just so we never hear any admittance that of what Hess was really doing in Scotland. Um, what was Hess really doing in Scotland? Hess was being an idiot. Hess was completely being an idiot. That's one of the trouble. People tend to invent up various conspiracy theories about Hess being in Scotland. Because they don't believe anyone could be that big an idiot. However, 
With experience of our own current politicians and any future generations who watch this video, I hope will agree with us. There are usually some who get surprisingly high who turn out to be idiots. Hess? Idiot. I don't think he was turned. In the nicest way, there I have a reason for this. A? He'd have had to be turned freaking quickly. The ship was literally went into harbour, was there maybe a day and out. And secondly... Canaris... He's not going anywhere at that point. He's a resourceful young officer, but he's not really worth anything at that point. He hasn't got any information that the British would bother or want from them. More of a thing, they probably have captured him. Because then they could have made a big thing parading that through the world. That would have been quite useful. They might have even prosecuted him for it. Because, you know, they could have probably arranged something. Uh, Bill Bond, very interesting when you story with your grandfather. How would uh, the Brits keep Canaris turned once he's back in Germany? Sure, if he was in their control in Britain and feeding the German information. But in 1915, he was not in German intelligence. But maybe, so of limited value as a British agent. That is one of the frustrating things about the Canary story. All the suggestions of a hidden truth that remains hidden. Uh, one thing about dirty business is once you are in, they usually don't get let you out. If you've been turned in 1915, they could always blackmail him with exposure and sweeten it with money, I guess. Back then, they could not have known he would rise so high. That would have been sheer luck. Mm. Again, no, I'm sorry. There are so many issues with this. Uh, Bill Bond, yes, I wouldn't uh, rule it out entirely, but usual, uh, but the usual fake summon position would have been a POW, yes. Um, then seeing Richard again, I think the main clue or evidence would be if he had been taken in Plymouth out of uniform and then called a spy, which was the ticket to the hangman track and back then unless he cooperated. Like when they took up my, my grandfather in Tower London, they told him he was going to be hanged unless he played ball. But if Canaris had been in uniform, I agree they would treat him like a prince of war. In the old days of sail, sail uh, old days of sail, sailors didn't have to wear formalized uniforms, but by all well, they mostly did. And since he was an officer, the need to be in uniform was stronger. Bill Boyne. Good point. He was traveling undercover, so would treat him as a spy. I wonder how long he was in Plymouth. Less than a day. Um, Ben Wilson, and he wasn't in Plymouth. He stayed on the ship. Ben Wilson, I have always been curious about Canaris story. I cannot see how an intelligence officer can escape from the Robinson Crusoe Island travel island and travel to and fro uh, through East England. Chile was a friend of Britain. I'm sure British intelligence had talented spotter uh, talent spotters. I can see that by the mid thirties he had concerns about the Nazis and reconnected with the British. You'll never know how can uh, how uh, no, and Canaris was a complicated man. I think you're all reading a lot more into Canaris than is actually there. I I, I do admit he's a talented and sci a, a very interesting spy. But honestly, I don't think anyone in 1915-40 would get so high, and I also don't think this is going to sound strange. Britain didn't have many resources in Chile. He managed to get out of Chile. Honestly, no one was expecting him to get out of South America. This is the problem. One of the advantages of travelling through Plymouth, which I think Canaris, because he is quite smart, probably worked out, is no one expects a German spy to turn up on a ship in Plymouth. And if they do, they expect him to get off and start trying to look around, not just hide on the ship. Probably he sat in his cabin for the day. Quite simple. He had friends on the ship. He managed to make friends. He hid. He stayed on the ship. He was working his passage. No one would have asked any questions. Oh, I just don't want to go ashore. Far easier. Bill Bond. He was a polygot. One of my favourite words. Hmm. Hashim. Anyone who can master six languages must have a brain like a heap of Rubik's cubes. I would agree with that. Andre Shrozas. So this is the chief, uh, uh, chief of staff of the Exodus Navy. These are absolutely gold. Uh, more people need to watch this. What's the plan? We have to reach 10,000 subscribers. Technically, we have to reach 13,000 subscribers because my aunt has done a bet by December 31st. If I reach 13,000 subscribers, she will wear a Blackburn Blackburn face mask and so will my poor uncle. And on 2nd of January, I'll be able to show it in brew ships. Um, Kingsrock, Quint is the prefix of five. Thank you. I couldn't remember when recording the video. 
And Deeks25, Canaris seems to be perfectly fit, the most influential person you've never heard of category. He does. Uh, there are a few others. I'm going to get do I'm going to do this on the British Canada the Allied, and the Allied one is going to be massive. Because the amount of people send me, oh, Chief Staff, the Canadian Navy, and all these things. The yes, S, they're all going to be in there. Australian Navy, Canadian Navy, Indian Navy, all these sorts of things that they massively expand. But also there are a number of intelligence officers I have to expand it to, and um, various other influential admirals, which are critical, which I haven't been... I'm, I'm probably I'm going to put Admiral Henderson in there and a few other equivalent of... Uh, the equivalents of him from various Allied navies, i.e. the American and the French, because the French technically start out as Allies, so I'm going to still treat the... Uh, I might do the French as separate, actually. I think I'm probably going to do the French as separate, fight, but it's going to be quite a big one. Anyway, as you can probably guess, it's now time for Arturo Riccardi. Who is my Well, I wouldn't say second favorite, second least liked Italian after Canvanari as in terms of cheaper staff. Um he's he's just he is so mm. Uh, he is really an interesting soul. Let's just go with that one. Let's go with interesting soul. That's just he has one. Um, uh, Shane Patrick, dude, you look tired. Love your channel, by the way. Uh, yeah, I'm responding to that. I was, I was, but believe it or not, the bed was more uncomfortable than the chair, so I decided to get some videos recorded. Yes. This is the thing. The first night I was, when I did, I think I might have done a live from the first travel lodge we stayed on the way home. And that was quite comfortable, that bed. The second night, oh my lord. I was in a family room on the first night to myself. Me and the dog in a family room. It was great. And the second night I was in what's called a double room. And another another one, and it was one of the most uncomfortable beds I have ever slept on. And I do have, I am a functioning insomniac on many occasions. And thanks, Rapid Razorback. If you haven't subscribed, you should. The content is amazing. Thank you. Anyway, Joseph Howard. Always awesome, Dr. Clark. Thank you. Uh, Steamwich. Uh, the story of Campione and Mascara, uh, Mascara was pretty touching. What a difficult time for Italy that was. It seems as that, that all through the Axis, there were, was this widespread willingness for the older officers to die, suicide really, rather than go on and face what was obviously coming. Many Germans did it in 1945, when they would probably not have even been war crime suspects, death before dishonour and all. And all this entails. That is not something that would be prevalent today. Like in 2008, Wall Street collapsed. There was no known suicides, while in 1929 there were hundreds of, if not thousands, including many heads of firms. Instead, the CEO of Goldman Sachs got a multi-million dollar bonus and remained top for several more years. I guess if there's no personal honor, there can't be dishonor. I would say there were a lot of suicides to do with the 2008 collapse, but most of those were not the top people, it seems. Um, but many, many people who lost their lives, lost their money, lost their... lost their everything. I know, I... Um... Not my family, but a friend of my family. Unfortunately, couldn't see a way out. And, yeah. This is another reason why I always encourage people to have, um, and this is off topic, multiple uh, to have multiple income streams. Always have other sources of money. Always have a side gig. Because you never know when your main gig will go and you need a side gig. And it's tiring. It means you are a pretty much a functioning workaholic. It can make your family and loved ones think you don't like, you don't care for them because you go, I'm sorry, I'm busy. But if it's important to you that you always have, be financially able to support and be uh, support your friends and family if they need it and independent yourself, then you need that side gig as part of your security blanket. You need that extra income stream. 
that's the way life goes. That and it. If they don't understand that, then they don't understand part of you. So you probably need to explain that better. But also, it's important for you because the thing is, as I've with YouTube and with all this stuff, I love doing YouTube. I love talking to students. I, I had a lovely email from uh, one of my patrons, and I was talking with him about it, um, about how best to support me. And I was going, well, I, I, I don't really mind. Both work out both are quite well. Patreon and YouTube subscriptions and the Super Chats, both, you know, each has pros and cons. And they do. But the thing is, the more I think about it, the more I work on it, and the one reason is why I actually have, rather than telling my aunt, I are lost already, as I've signed up to this 13,000 subscribers thing, and I'm actually telling you about it. It's because I've honestly looked at the sums and gone, you know what? If that gets to 13,000 subscribers, that's above the 10,000 mark. If it's above the 10,000 mark, that's the point at which YouTube starts becoming... How do I put this? Not a, a research money in terms of funding the research I really want to do and getting that done, which enables me to write the books I want to write, which will hopefully help me get the tenure for academic position. But either way, the books income and the YouTube income will hopefully provide me with enough money coming in that if the university contracts dry up again like they did during COVID at one point and various other points, I won't be financially sitting there going, and I'm lucky because I do have multiple income streams. I am a contract lecturer who has more than one contract and works for more than one company, much to HRMC's um, joyous upset. Hence, I have to have an accountant because, it, frankly, it confuses the British PAYE system. That's pay as you earn on the income tax. But it certainly makes me a lot. It, it, let's put it this way, it means I try my level best to never be in a scenario that I have one income stream and if it goes, I'm out. Because I never want to be in that scenario. Because then I won't be able to run my car, I won't be able to look after my dogs, I won't be able to look after my mom and sister. And Okay, maybe I'm not always the most wealthy person or I was a PhD student, a student and a junior lecturer now for nearly a decade. Uh, these are not high paying, especially when your contract works. But I've always been able to run a car. I've always been able to contribute towards home. Differing amounts, but usually enough that's helpful. Contribute towards the family holiday. Contribute towards it because I've had these multiple jobs and always kept it. But if I hadn't had those multiple jobs, there would have been times when my main career would have been, oh, uh, nothing's happened. Ouch. Anyway, uh, Nick Morden, thanks for the great video, Dr. La. I recently read the books about the Littorio du and Dulio Cavo class. I often thought, darn, if the Cruise Marine OKW would have made some less arrogant and more sensible decisions, maybe the Rage Marina could have been a great, pro great problem for the Allies. But Germans, do not honor, uh, uh, Germans not honoring the Allies is sadly something some people over here claim to be very different from their ancestors, but they act like them. Um, I would have to say that, honestly... I think the trouble for the uh, for the Germans is that they meet admirals like Arturo Riccardi and Cavanari, who promise a lot and don't deliver anything. So that gives them a a, a very strange, a very uh, solid view of it. That's not worth investing in. But strategically, the Italian navy was more of a problem for the Royal Navy on a global World War II scale than the Germans. Now that usually gets me into trouble. So let me explain. Okay, if Royal Navy is fighting the Germans, that requires a maritime, uh, that is a war of commerce, a girder course, commerce warfare, that requires one type of fleet, blockade and count anti-submarine, and some protection, uh, some forces to deal with surface raiders. The fight the Japanese requires a battle fleet, probably centered on fast carrier task forces, and with far other fast flat, uh, the, the fast battleships that the British have, uh, a large number of the fast battleships the British have, but that to hold the Indian Ocean and protect Australia's west and north, uh, west and north coast, while the U.S. Navy protects the east coast, sort of thing. And they're working together, maybe in Southeast Asia, and maybe pushing up. 
If you don't have the Italian Navy in World War II, the Royal Navy can run that because if there's a major problem in the Atlantic, they can shuttle back through the Indian Ocean, Suez Canal, straight along the Mediterranean and be there. It's not instant, but it's a lot quicker than going around Africa and having to come up. It's a lot quicker. And it's the same if there's a problem in the Far East, they can shuttle. The moment you have the Italians in World War II, that's when the Royal Navy's real nightmares begin, because that stops the Mediterranean shuffle. So, you can say fighting the Germans costs a lot more because of the way the convoy war, war goes. You are correct. You can say fighting the Japanese is a far bigger task because they have a far larger far more capable fleet, and you would be correct. But strategically, for Britain, the worst placed navy for them to have to fight is the Italians, because of where they are. So if they've been properly supplied and properly led, i.e. they're good admirals, the ones who took after Ernesto Basgali, who I've talked about and in part 14 of 14, and who I'll be answering questions on later, is a real problem. Because those admirals with those ships in that place cause trouble. Cause a lot of trouble. Right. And now it's Asami and Nagano. And we are at 30 two minutes so i will probably do him and we'll see how fast we get through him uh but if we don't then well we get through him but then i might then break it up into another episode depends how what the questions are like eric Vasapa enjoying the series thank you John Hargreaves, the Japanese are and always have been fatalistic. Regards. To an extent, yes, but Nagano... They're not so much fatalistic as they realise their own limitations, but the thing is they don't do much about it. This is my main complaint about the Japanese. They, they, they know what their limitations are, but they don't do much about it. This is this gentleman. This is Asami Nagano. And... I have a lot of respect for... Them as admirals, I don't agree with, as I said as the Nazism earlier, I'm going to say this again, their actions in China, various other things, not nice people, okay? Just going to do that before anyone complains, not nice people. But I have the Japanese admirals, by far I came out of this, there are some Italian admirals, one Italian admiral, and a couple of others Italian admirals mentioned uh, in uh, Riccardi, uh, Riccardi's uh, video, I came out of a lot of respect for. Japanese admirals, barring one I came out of respect for. As admirals. Germans. Honestly, I have a sort of grudging respect for Canaris. But Raider I consider a bit of a fantasist, and Donitz I consider a control freak who's... just becomes a Nazi sycophant. See much. Regarding animals, damned if we do, damned if we don't, Simon. The US would have accepted an end to further aggression in China. Really? Would they? A full withdrawal would not have been required, just some symb uh, symbolic withdrawals. Did Japan understand this? Did they perceive this? Did America communicate this to Japan in a way America and Japan would understand it? Did Japan get understand? Uh, did Japan have a uh, have understanding of America? As I said in the video, neither Japan or America were actually talking to each other. They were, they were talking large. It seems at visions of each other, which are completely different from what they are. And they could have always got have gotten that oil, or at least some of it, and the rest they could buy from the colonial free drudge. So the idea the U.S. forced them in war is nonsense. You can say to Steve, that's the lovely thing about history and looking back with hindsight. We can say that if you look at these things. 
but it's what they perceive at the time that matters. This is the reality. History sometimes is about the facts, but sometimes it's a perception of the facts of the time at the time by the people involved. And the Japanese perceive the Americans as aggressive, as aggressive and trying to destroy them. That's what they see the Americans doing. They see it as jostling for control of the Pacific. They see themselves already having been limited by treaty. They see the way the Americans, they perceive them, push the British to get rid of the Anglo-Japanese alliance. Uh, all, all these things, they, they that's their opinion, uh, forming their opinion of the Americans and their actions. So they see the Americans demanding the withdrawal from China. Why? Why do they think the Americans are demanding they withdraw from China? They're thinking they're demanding they withdraw from China because the Americans want China. So basically, they see it as America demanding them to withdraw from China so that the Americans get an empire in China. And to the Japanese, China's their backyard. That should be their empire. The Americans have South America. This is the Japanese perception of the time. I'm not saying I agree with it or disagree with it. I'm not sure I disagree with it, but yeah. And the, the thing is, I'm not. Uh, this is what they are perceiving it as. They always had a choice. They don't perceive they have a choice, and the choice was to rejoin the international community. Where they are treated as second tier, quite literally, in the, na in the naval treaties. Remember that thing? Remember I I have in a previous video, I pointed out that, you know, you have a one ocean navy, two ocean navy, and a five ocean navy. And at the end of it, Britain and America basically agree, agree to be equals, and Japan gets to be seven tenths. Japan didn't like that. They didn't want to be second tier. They didn't feel they should be second tier. They felt... They were a proud, strong, capable, advanced nation. They hadn't been conquered by the anyone. They were, you know, a first-tier power in their mind. They didn't feel that way. So you're saying, yes, they can do those things. But if they join, what concessions do they have to make? If they felt such a thing was impossible for them, that was their choice, not that of the US. Well... The U.S. had insisted the British and Ameri uh, the British and Japanese, the British break the alliance with Japan. They, they they had pushed for that, and Britain had agreed because, frankly, they share an ocean with America. Uh, they they share an ocean with America, and that would be more annoying than fighting the Japanese. And they didn't think they were going to fight the Japanese at that point. And they thought they could keep it up informally, which they certainly did try to. And you have other issues. The one thing you can always count on a psychopath or sociopath to do is blame the victims for the crimes perpetrated on them. They're not psychopaths or sociopaths. This is the point, and it's very easy, and I, I, I hate it when... There are some legitimate people in history who you can go around and make that application about. But no, the Japanese and the Americans are all victims of the decisions they make at the time. Okay? They make one decision, and that leads to another decision, and that leads to another decision. And this is what happens. The Japanese make their decision. The Americans make their decision. The Japanese make their next decision in, response, in light of their perception of the reasons why the Americans made their decision. The Americans then make their decision in response to their perceptions of why the Japanese made their decision. And it goes on and on and on and on. And if they don't actually understand each other, they're never going to understand why they're making the decisions. They're never going to understand what they're trying to tell each other. And this is why you end up with war. And this in no way says that Japan's nice. But in nicest way... Neither was America always in that period. In fact, there are a lot of decisions America makes which are not nice to their neighbours. Not nice to other nations. Same with Britain. They don't. Even today, countries do not always... Uh, countries which we might consider nice do not always make nice decisions. Because 
of interests or because of perceptions of the interests. It happens. But that doesn't make them psychopaths or sociopaths. It makes them human, which is ultimately far scarier than writing them off and attributing a mental illness. Because if we admit that they are humans like us who made bad decisions, that means that anyone is capable of making bad decisions and going down the same road. Tojo, potentially. But the vast majority of the Japanese political class and people in running the country, no. And even him, I'm not so sure. I wouldn't like to say that's not my area of qualification or skill. And honestly, I normally, one of those people who are, it is their area of qualification or skill, would not refuse to do it unless they could actually meet the person. Ben Wilson, a what if? What if Japan had found the large oil reserves in Sakhan, now, now self sufficient in oil? <sighs> problems. Lots of problems. But also, it. It's one of the strange things, it might have actually stopped war. And I say this because it would have made them self-sufficient in the thing they were most scared of lacking, and the thing they found most crippling. And that's the point. You cripple their oil supply. And that was the thing. The, American, the Japanese knew the Americans had controlled their oil supply. The Japanese were worried about this, but they weren't planning on war until the Americans started trying to sanction, uh, started sanctioning it and started causing issues with it. The thing was, the Americans had the gold bullet the whole time. The Japanese knew it. There was... Uh, and the thing is, you, when you actually pull the golden bullet, the trouble is, you either pull it and expect there to be war, or you don't pull it because you have pulled your golden bullet. If Japan has its oil and oil supplies, then it's no longer a golden bullet for the United States, even if it does come from the sea. They might have had to install those slant rig drilling platforms or something interesting. All right. Thank you, Doug M, and thank you, Deeks25. And I think we're going to leave this one here. And we'll start episode uh, part four with Carl Bonnets.